dying for this. It's nice. Mmm, jammy fruits. It's spicy. Bit of vanilla. Mmm. Welcome to One Landscape. Welcome. We're here with David Ward. And Tim Parkin. And we'll be talking today about some of David's travels around the world. Uh, yeah. And the photographs generated there up from. Been, uh, been quite busy. Uh, we'll also be looking at, because I've spent quite a bit of time over the last few weeks looking at this thing. Uh, Canon 5DS, that's the 5DS, I've also had the 5DSR, and a range of lenses, 24 to 70s, 16 to 35s, um, and putting them to, through their paces. Uh, we've had an article go live today on the magazine with the results of those tests, uh, and we'll, we'll discuss a few of those results as we, as we go along, yeah. interspersed with some of your images. Sounds like a plan to me. We also have a load of questions from people. Uh, regarding the canons, regarding uh, the photography and the travels. Uh, but also, if you want to ask any questions as we go along, uh, don't forget to send your questions by Twitter or by email. Um, which email sh should we use? Info at onlandscape.co.uk. So we'll, we'll jump into the deep end. And um, if you can tell us where you've been travelling, David. Uh, well, I, I mean, I've, I've just brought about, I don't know, 25 images with me this evening from the last six months. So, um, oh, it's nice of the RAF to pop in. Nice um, delivery of wine. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> it's much better than Tesco's. Um, and uh, I've just put them in chronological order. So we start in Scotland and we go through to, I just came back from New Zealand, Two or three weeks ago. Um, so this this first image uh, is of many of you will recognise of Slioch in Scotland. A uh, slightly different viewpoint from how it's normally shot because it's normally shot with the probably the the lakeside trees. And I I walked inland a little bit um, to to get this picture. Quite a cold day, very heavy snow showers coming through every once in a while, um, and uh, found this relic of uh, the Caledonian forest which at one stage would have covered all of this uh, area um, and then you know a lone surviving tree behind and I, and I liked that juxtaposition yes. and the, the, really what makes it I think is the snow though is the way that the snow is uh, blown very gently against the side of the stump and against the uh, the the uh, standing tree. It's, it's outlined the tree hasn't it? Especially it has that, yeah. Especially that rear tree. Yeah. And somebody actually asked the question, one of the questions that came in was about NDs. It saying, was. Should you use NDs? Yeah, um, our, 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 it was from um, Jim Hamilton. And he said, are ND grad filters really necessary out on location? Or is it OK to use later in Photoshop and Lightroom? We've actually had another one as well, which is from uh, Jim Robertson. When shooting digital, ND filters or exposure blending. So, yes. Yeah. Um, so. I tried to, wherever possible, uh, to get it, the dynamic range, as well managed as I can in camera. So I will, mostly, I will use some sort of grad. And in this one, I think I only had a one-stop grad from what, memory. What camera was this on? Uh, this is on a Fuji XE1. So are you using the little uh, Yeah, this is using the, um, yeah, the, the Lee 75 system, yeah. Um, and I just wanted, just to bring it down a little bit because the, highlight at the top of Slioch that I mean it looks like there's a halo but there wasn't a halo it actually was just bright cloud behind Slioch um, I just wanted to bring that back down so I didn't get any overexposure on that and then afterwards processed in in Lightroom to to kind of even things up the problem always about using them with a where you've got a tree sticking into the sky like that yeah. is that you, you're likely to block it in a bit yes but the great thing now with with Lightroom is you can go back in afterwards and use the shadow recovery tool and bring detail back out of those maybe slightly blocked. So would um, I be correct in saying you put the grad on and then try and correct for the grad afterwards to try and make it look more natural? So for, I presume the top of Sleok there would have got darker because of your grad. Yeah, yeah. So I would have, I did a little bit of work afterwards just to bring a little bit of um, ex probably just exposure on Sleok 
just to bring that up a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's always a difficult one with a situation like that. Where do you put the grad down to? Um, especially because the brightest areas were immediately behind Sleok and immediately behind the tree. Um, that's where the, the, the strongest sun was. Um, you don't want it to be completely overexposed in those positions, but in fact it probably is right bordering on white. I don't know, can we go back to the... Um, this is the JPEG, so it's a bit tricky, but can yeah. we go back to live view to the wider view? Can we, uh, uh, how do we do that one? Show the histogram? I don't know if we oh, can. Oh, yes, I think we can, yeah. There so it's go. right, it's piled up right against the end, but I mean, it is the JPEG, so. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a little bit. That area there looks like the only area that's overexposed. A little bit behind the tree, but I don't think that matters. Yeah. Um, and that, that was probably in the tiff, you probably got that. Yeah, I think that's. Um, that all works fine, I think. Um, so, the reason to use them there rather than use them afterwards is that you are compressing the dynamic range of the light getting into the camera, which is going to give you better signal to noise ratio in the shadows. Now, yeah. we've talked about this a little bit. Um, the issue becomes as sensors get better and the signal to noise ratio becomes less of a problem, do you yes. still need to do it? If you yeah. look at, you know, something like the Canon, yeah. which has a much better signal to noise ratio and a bigger dynamic range than earlier cameras do, yeah. is it still worthwhile? And I, I personally feel it is. I mean I, I think even with the cameras that are getting better dynamic range, I mean, for instance, Joe's got an IQ two eighty, which is an extraordinary dynamic range. Thirteen uh, stops? 13 stops, but also it's really clear in the shadows as well. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's not just how, many, how much dynamic range you've got, it's what the quality of that noise looks like. Yeah. And it's a very organic noise. Um, but you still use grads, because yeah. inevitably in the darker tones, you're going to get noise. You're going to get, um, you're not going to get pattern noise especially, but you want, if you want everything clear, you, you want to try and bring those tones up as much as possible. Yeah. Um, and using, using the Canon, using the Sony, using film colour neg, even with colour neg that's got 19 stops of dynamic range. If I'm thinking about reducing the burning in the sky, I'll still use a grad because right. the tonality is better. I mean, th and this also, I mean, this, this, you know, we're skirting around the issue, which is uh, that quite frequently the dynamic range of your subject, the contrast range of your subject, is far larger than the dynamic range of any camera. Yeah. Um, you know, humans can see something in excess of 20, 25 stops, and you're saying that the IQ has a, a best of I, I think best that, of breed of 19. Well, for colour neck, sorry, 19 stops. For sorry, color, for yeah. Negative for yeah. Um, so we're still a long way off what, what the human eye can do, which is why you have to do processing in something like Lightroom afterwards, because mm. you have to... I mean, I think the whole point of doing the processing is to try and make it look close to how it was when you were there when when the when as a photographer you witnessed that event yeah. i don't think oh, i don't use it for any other purpose really no I, i'm i think the um the nice thing about the cameras that are starting to have a lot of dynamic range is that you can get away with not using a grad yeah at, at a push so if you yeah. if you're in a situation where you want to get a grab shot or the light's changing dramatically, you don't have time, you can take that shot yeah. and it will be acceptable. Whereas yeah. perhaps on some of the older sensors, you couldn't do that. Yeah. So that, that's a nice thing. But if you've got the option, then I think it, the, the results will uh, be better for using a grad or, or blending multiple exposures. And I presume you don't blend exposures. You would I don't typically blend, use a grad. I don't blend exposures, no. Uh, I would use a grad instead. And, and I mean, uh, there are situations with a fast-moving subject where blending exposures yes. really won't work, where you need to have a single capture. Yeah. Um, so, and I suppose, it, I mean, basically all of this practice comes from my use of film for 35 years, where you didn't have the choice. Yeah. So it's become ingrained. Um, but it's also about practice, and I know a lot of people are averse to using grads because when they've used them, it's become obvious that they've used them because they've placed them incorrectly or they've used the wrong strength or or whatever. Um, and that puts them off carrying on using them. But it's that it's about 
practice, it's about developing the craft of using them. And, and if you spend some time doing that, then actually, eventually, you'll be able to use them so that nobody can notice they're there. Yeah, yeah. And then it saves you a whole lot of hassle and a whole lot of heartache later on, I think. You end up with a better quality file and you end up with something that's easier to process. You don't have to spend as much time processing it or maybe something that you could dig detail out of the shadows, which you wouldn't have been able to get before. You because know, they'd these have been are, too dark. These yes. are all positives, aren't they? I mean, it's, it, pe people do say, well, do we need to use grads now? You know, and, and these, it, uh, there are discussions about how much dynamic range you need. People are still using Valvia and functionally dealing with maybe six stops dynamic range. Yeah, well, which, I do, yeah, yeah. And amazingly, you get results. Well, you do, and the question of constraints comes up there because I think artistic constraints are are actually an important thing. They actually make us try harder. So when you have a limited dynamic range and you have to deal with that, it makes you think harder about actually how are you going to make that picture work. Yes. And it does mean that some things are going to be impossible, just like they would be with any technical constraint, you know. If you if you want to freeze the motion on a bullet going through a balloon, you're going to need incredibly fast flash for that, aren't you? And fantastic syncing. And you're not be able, going to be able to do that with your average camera because you just won't have the capability for it. But you can do so many other things without that. You know, yeah. it's, it, it's... Edward Weston says something about you. We make of ourselves good enough technicians in order to be able to achieve our aims. And I think there is perhaps a, a, a bias these days towards thinking that everything can be solved in a technical way and that the technical solution should only support whatever our artistic aims are, not the other way around, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I do wonder sometimes as well whether working within a smaller dynamic range is useful because paper only has six stops of dynamic range, you know, light reflected off paper. Yeah. So if you make a print, and you've got a picture that works within six or seven stops of dynamic range, it's going to look more natural because the light contrasts are as they would have been in the scene. Yeah, so otherwise, effectively, you're sort of tone mapping, are you? you I mean, well, you would have to, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes you take pictures in very bright, high contrasty lights. You try and print it out and it looks unnatural because you've had to compress that tonality so much. Yeah. Um, and I've seen results quite a few times where I've waited for soft light to try and reduce the dynamic range, and the results are better for it in a print. Yeah, mm. yeah. Anyway, one picture. Oh, a little bit later on. Um, same thing? Uh, same trip. Same trip, yeah. This was a Torridon workshop that Joe and I ran, um, actually based at Shield Egg. Uh, so the, the great thing about being there is you're right in the sort of heart of the of the landscape and it doesn't take very long to get to anywhere around the loch in the maximum travel time was maybe half an hour 40 minutes um, so this is sort of revisiting in a way uh, an image that I made kind of 20 years ago probably now 15 years ago at least um, of a boulder overlooking upper loch Torridon uh, which in itself was an homage to a picture by Paul Wakefield um, they're all in the same sort of area but I I felt that it was worth revisiting because the conditions were just so different when I made the the original image it was um, beautiful golden light yes. um, very variegated cloud um, a classic sort of uh, yeah sort of big landscape shot and this was really very difficult conditions strong snow showers mixed in with hail rain gale force winds, um, hard to stand up at times, danger of exposure. Um, when was this? This January? This was January, yeah. yeah. yeah when we arrived for the workshop, um, they'd had 112 mile an hour winds on Stornoway the day before. Uh, we had no electricity the first day we were there. Um, it, was, it was really, really exciting conditions. And all the way through the week, we had big storm systems coming through. Um, and I just... You know, I wanted to make an image that really reflected what it was like, you know, with that uh, that sort of intensity with the darkness of the cloud and the the snow and rain passing through in the background. And I, I think I only 
took two frames and then it all came on top of me and I couldn't see more than about 25, 50 metres max. So, um, I w yeah, I, I just wanted to make something that was a little bit more moody, I suppose. Yeah. Um, also, I mean, it, one thing, I mean, I suppose it's, it comes into that category to an extent, but the real big thing that most people do with landscape is they want to make something that's celebratory. Yes. And I wanted something that was uh, the mood was slightly different well, from that. It, it happens so often in Scotland, that, that sort of weather. Yeah, that you, yeah. You, you shouldn't just put the camera down, that's for sure. No, well, it, it's it's always interesting. I think you do, do you do workshops and tours and people say, oh, I'd never come out in conditions like this normally. I, I would have looked at the forecast and I would have thought, no, it's a day in by the fire. But it, it so often is the most exciting time to be Ch out there. Changeable weather. Yeah, it's a changeable always, weather. Always and you think about Mark Littlejohn's winning image for landscape photography. Yeah, you know, it was rain. just really miserable conditions and a great picture. So I think it's always worth going out. It might not be very pleasant for a while, but it is called outdoor photography and you do have to be able to deal with it. <laughs> so uh, this, is, um, this is from France, from the Auvergne. You might notice they're all quite wintry. I did have probably the longest period of winter weather, yeah. really, because I was sort of dotting around and I, everywhere I went I managed to... Is this unseasonable weather for the Auvergne in that time of year? Uh, yeah, the weird thing about the Auvergne, it's massive central and it gets up to um, 1,800 metres, I think, mm. um, 1,900 metres, something like that. But actually the coldest time is often uh, March, April, May. Okay. So it's cold in uh, November, December, then it warms up in January and Feb. This was in Jan. Um, and this was maybe going through one of those uh, changeable periods because uh, snow on the on the trees here, but it was actually freezing rain whilst I was yes, that's taking pretty, that photograph. Pretty grim. So that's some it's about super cooled water, isn't it? That's hitting hitting you and yeah, freezing so instantly. Yeah, uh, so the tripod had an inch or more of ice on it by the time I finished the surfaces of the camera, everything. Yeah, somebody asked a question about that. Yeah, they? they were asking about weather sealing of the 5DS versus the 1DX. It's a specific question. Uh, I can answer that briefly, is the 1DX is pretty bulletproof. I think it's the only camera David Clapper said never, ne has never failed. Um, the 5DS doesn't have anywhere near that level of weather sealing, but from the experiences of people who have gone out with it, it's been pretty rock solid. Mm. I've used the 1DX in... Uh in Iceland on a day when we had 300 millimetres of rain in 24 hours yeah. and absolutely fine. I mean, as always, the problem becomes just keeping water yeah. off the lens. The lenses are much more likely to fail than the... I know of people who've dunked the 1DX. Really? Some, and it's been absolutely fine. You know, as long Dropped as it's not it in, in there a for a long time, in a, no, in a little river, or, and then just grabbed it back out again pretty quickly and it's been fine. That's it's, impressive. That is very impressive, isn't it? Uh, yeah. As long as the lens is sealed as well that's the yeah I mean so. I don't know how they're not all are they the, the L series lenses are no you have to have a seal on the gasket at the back and you also have to have a filter on the front to make them properly sealed right okay because the, the the lens element moves in and out so there's a gap there so but what happens with a with a zoom uh, I think it's the design of it there's gaskets on the the thing that stick goes in and out um, the elements right and there's gaskets on the focus rings supposedly um, that's, that's what they say, and um, experience backs it up. 5DS, I wouldn't dunk it. Right, okay. Um, but other cameras, I mean, what were you using here? That's an XE1. Yeah, um, and that was fine. Yeah. Compact uh, cameras seem very good by the sound of it in general. That, I should, I, yeah, I've not really had any problems. I mean, I did, um, years ago, I had Panasonic little LX. LX5 and then an LX7. Yeah. And the, um, the 5 I, I had out in dreadful conditions and in the seven I went out and it was just heavy drizzle mm. for about an hour and I completely fried it. Yeah? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it was dead, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I didn't have any problems. I had a Panasonic GF after that and that was that was fine. Um, XE1's been out in all sorts of weather with me now. Very, very heavy rain, um, freezing rain in this situation. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's predictable, is it? Because I know I had a Sony A900, which was didn't say anything about weather sealing at all. Yeah. And yet I've been out for a nine hours solid torrential rain right. and left it on the floor while I've been taking pictures. And I had to pour water out of the eyepiece before now, and it's been still worked. Really? 
Uh, yeah. And yet cameras, which are supposedly reasonably weather sealed, sometimes have a problem. Mm. So I think the best thing is to talk to people. Yeah. Experiences with it or look online. Well, I don't know, the 5D Mark II, I think it was, um, some of them had a problem with the screen leaking right. on the back. But it wasn't all of them. And yep. sometimes it just, the screen went a bit funny with lines on it. And then you took it back to your hotel room got and you better. dried it out and it got better. Yeah. And sometimes it was terminal. So, you know, I suppose any camera is going to have variability in manufacturing and, um, you know, so that unless it actually says that it's properly weather sealed, I suppose you can't 100% no. trust it. And right. even the cameras that are weather sealed don't have standards next to them that say how weather sealed they are. So, so they, there's, no, there's, no, um, there's no sort of kite mark thing no. for them? No. I, th I think there are very few of these tough cameras, I think, have them, but that's about it. Right. So, so this, this particular situation here is this, I believe you're doing a tour. There. I am, yeah, I'm going to the other next march, yeah, yeah, going back, yeah. Because um, I was just blown away with it, I mean, there's, there's a few few pictures coming up of, um, from there. Um, it was just incredible. The, the, it's rolling countryside, um, bald hills with just a few trees here and there uh, when you're up at the heights, but in the valley floors there's a lot of woodland. Um, uh, most people are on the ski slopes, which leaves you an awful lot of mountain and hillside where there isn't anybody. Right. So you've got great conditions, you've got interesting subject matter, um, and nobody else to bother you. There's nobody else in, in the way. So yeah. it's really fascinating. This was a, this was a shot. Uh, air temperature was probably mm, hovering about freezing, I think, probably. It had been very cold overnight. Um, I knelt to take this picture because I'm really quite close. I'm probably um, 18 inches, may less than that, probably uh, from the from the foreground grass. And what I hadn't realised was that um, where I was kneeling, there was a stream underneath the snow. So <laughs> my knee went through um, through the the snow into the stream. I take the picture. I stand up. Actually, no, the air temperature now, I think about it, was about minus seven. And instantly, the trousers just froze. Solid knees. Solid knees, absolutely solid knees, yeah. So that was, um, walking back to, to the vehicle was quite, quite tricky. Um, but somebody asked about focus stacking. Somebody did it? ask about focus stacking. Let me just see if I can no, find it. I don't the... do it very often, but this is an occasion where um, I do. Um, if you can find the question. Uh, one, two, three, four, six, 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 six. There we go. Uh, would like, uh, this is Norma McKellar, would like the um, guest's idea on the current craze of focus stacking in landscape uh, rather than macro, which seems more and more admissible and how to do it well. Now, you focus stacked. I did in this occasion, but it's only two stacks, so it's hardly really a kind of... It's not macro style. No, it's not. Um, I did it because I couldn't get even if I stopped down to f16 which would have given me all sorts of problems with it not being very sharp because of diffraction I couldn't get foreground grass and trees sharp so I now just this is Fuji again is it Fuji camera yeah this FC. is on the XE1 yeah. again so um, so I just uh, just did two exposures one for the foreground and one for the background trees um, and then photoshopped them and yeah just blended the two and it's nice and easy to do with snow obviously you don't have yeah. you don't have lots of um, difficult details to cope with uh, and I don't actually have a problem with that because if I'd shot this on the 5.4 I would have used tilt yeah. to give me that um, I just didn't happen to have the 5.4 with me on this trip so I didn't I didn't do it I I mean I don't I certainly don't see any moral problem with focus stacking do you not at all no it's no. just a technique isn't it yeah if if there is there, there has been interesting debates in the wildlife photographer of the year of the constraints around focus stacking because certain people have taken pictures where they've focus stacked and then waited for uh, an hour or so until the last frames the last bits were captured so you have a situation where you had separate parts of the picture cap captured at separate times right which um, is that real? If the lighting has changed, you could have the moon and the sun in the same picture when they weren't up at the same time in reality. Um, so what, what, what sort of, I mean, give me a sort of uh, 
context about what the images are? Are they? Uh, well, this the, one of them was a foreground a, detail of a. Yeah, the one, one of them in particular was a picture of a, I think there's a frog next to a pool, um, and the the frog was taken in the foreground, captured. Um, oh, this is that's right. There was a scenic in the background. Yeah. And obviously, the ser series of pictures taken quite quickly. Yeah. And then a bit later, on a slightly different frame, so a slightly different angle, right, was a picture with a frog in it, okay. focused on the foreground. Okay. And they'd combine these two pictures together, which you could, they were overlapping like quite a bit, so you could almost say they're a panorama. Um, but they were focused at different points. But there was about an hour between them, I think. So is, it, is that admissible? Because it looked to me like somebody had taken a shot and then gone, oh, there's a frog there get the camera back out, take a picture, and then blended the two together when they got back. Yeah, that's, that's kind of tricky, isn't it? Because actually, I suppose, you technically, you're, you're into montage rather than just mm. trying to overcome the, the, the yeah. focus um, limitations. Sh shadows had changed between the two and things yeah. like that. So you had a situation where the shadows are pointing in different directions, potentially. Yeah. Um, so but then you get into the, all the grey areas. Like, we, we, we've, you know, we've talked about this a lot about you know, what's true and what's not true, don't you? I, I, I took these two frames, I don't know, 15 seconds apart. Yeah. Maybe not even that. I think I might have waited for a bit of wind to die down, so there might have been a bit of a delay between the two frames. Um, but then what becomes the acceptable length of time? Yeah, well, I've, I've done pictures before now where I've taken, taken the picture, great um, light on the background, and I've had a fern, huge fern in the foreground. Yeah. And I'm on a four second exposure and the ferns wobbled around when I've taken the first shot. Right. And then I've stayed there and taken about eight frames waiting for this bleeding fern to stay still. And by the time I took the last picture, the whole background was covered in mist. Right. Uh, and so I compiled the two together. I used the nice light from the first one and the, and the fern from the last one. Right. And really neither of those are valid because both of them, it's, it's honest to the subject because that fern was there just happened to be blurred in the first one. What? Light was similar on mm. the foreground. <laughs> I, don't, I, mean, I don't know that there are any answers the to these things, The wildlife of the year do it quite nicely by, say, by saying you should be true to the subject. Right, okay. So, should not deceive, I think, is more what they say. Yeah, well, that, that in itself it's, is, it's a, is, a, is, a, is a tip, is yeah. a tricky but it philosophical allows, area, isn't it? It allows judges to make the decision then, which is probably the way it should be. Yeah. Because the judges are the so, final arbiters. But if we go back to the Landscape Photographer of the Year a couple of years ago with, yes. the, with the boats, yes. the boat sheds, um, that sky was from somewhere else entirely, that wasn't was, it? That was, I'm not sure it was somewhere else entirely, but it was definitely from a different day, right. a different time. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's not true. I'd say that's being dishonest. It's, it's deceiving. Yeah. So I, I mean, that's that's my rule. If I have any, is is don't do anything that would seem to deceive the viewer. Yeah. So it, it is a it is a difficult difficult area. I think. Yeah. Um, we had quite cold conditions. Yes. Is, it, <laughs> is this what happens when you get freezing rain? Um, this was actually before the freezing rain. Yeah. It was a day when it was uh, probably minus. Minus seven or eight again, um, and 40 or 50 kph winds at times, Ouch. which was really bloody tricky. But obviously this particular point was um, sheltered because I don't think the icicles oh, would have lost. stayed on the, if they'd been in the wind. We were in, in a wooded area there. And I just found that an interesting challenge because you're trying to, it's an incredibly complex subject and you're trying to work out how you're going to frame that where you're going to place your focus point and the antithesis of the focus stacking situation, you actually want quite a narrow plane yeah. of focus, otherwise the it becomes the subject becomes far too complicated, I think. Yes. Um, and then you work out, well, yeah, okay, well, where do I want to place the plane of focus? And it ends up inevitably being a com uh, you know, some sort of um, compromise. Yeah. Here's a question for you, but talking about focus stacking, because with a, with a uh, view camera, you could tilt the plane of focus. 
yeah. to try and choose a, an appropriate plane there. Well, in fact, that's probably what I would have done. In that, I would have probably yeah. done a, a compound plane. So you, yeah, instead of just laying it in, you you know you move sort it of, around left yeah. to right. Because then the branches, which are at slightly different angles to each other, you could. Now the question is, if I can focus stack that picture, I can choose which bits I want in focus. So I mean, for instance. Areas in that picture aren't going to lie in a plane. The, the branches no. you really want sharp. Whereas if you focus stacked, you can actually pick out those areas and make the make the branches you wanted. You could go one further, couldn't you? You can go get yourself a light tray. A light tray and do the whole thing. Yeah. But if you did focus stack it, do you think would you see anything wrong with that? You had, you'd end up with a curved plane of focus. But is there anything invalid about that? I don't know that there is. I mean, ha okay, curved plane of focus. We we did the we lens, lens testing with curved, curved planes. planes of focus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly, if you if you if you do a stitch for a panorama, um, and curved plane, you're ending up with a curved plane, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. A rotational panorama. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, not if you do a side by side shift, but most most people do a rotational panorama, don't they? So, really, that's valid because the idea of being out of focus like that is not something you see with your eye anyway. As your eye pans around, you would be focusing on the individual parts of it. Yeah, yeah. you would. Yeah. Yeah, you mm. can't you can't really force yourself to see the out of focus, can you? In no. the way that it actually is, because the foveal part of the vision is the only bit that's sharp. Yeah. So I look at you, you're sharp, and everything around you is unsharp. But I can't really make myself very aware of that. No. We know it, but we don't. We don't. No. Uh, we don't apprehend it in a conscious way. You can sort of, of relax your eye and try and see everything blurred, but just to, just to have a. Yeah. Drop focus, like you see photographically, doesn't really exist. No, it doesn't. And there's an interesting thing about um, where the point of drop focus is as well, isn't it? In the movies, quite often the foreground can be very out of focus. You're following a moving figure through a, through a scene, say. Yeah. Um, if you do that with a still image where the foreground is very out of focus, it quite often doesn't work. Yes. At least it doesn't, in the, it doesn't in the landscape. It, it can work with wildlife subjects yeah so so why is that you know there's there's a there's a question about human yeah. perception there and how we apprehend things isn't there there's a, there's a bit of a thing where movement can simulate three dimensions yeah so movement 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 depth perception yeah so uh, we can get away with you know that things in the foreground because it's passing in front of other things whereas yeah. if, in a photograph it just looks like an obstruction yeah yeah it visually stands in the way of you and the subject I think yeah yeah, yeah. Very minimal. Very minimal, yeah. Um, somebody, I think, was it Despina, asked about um, wider landscapes and... Yeah, did you continue your approach to photography concentrating on close-ups or did you also go for the wider view? So basically, it's, you, you started wider and honed in, I think. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's quite a wide view, I suppose, in that, you know, the, it's several hundred metres across, probably. Um, and it has a sky. And it has a sky, yeah. So, so in depth terms, it's... Kilometres at least, uh, but I suppose I'm using some of the lessons that I've learnt in an image like this. Some of the lessons I've learnt from the um, from the more abstract pictures. Um, I mean, what what drew me to it was the fact that the initially anyway, I, I like the shapes of the trees, but I also loved the way that the sky on one side really stood out against the snow, and then on the other side it almost blends with it. Yeah, um, and I and I like that sort of ambiguity of, of space and light there. Um, so yes, I do shoot wider images. I obviously shoot wider images, but I, I think I apply quite a lot of the lessons that I've learned from working with, the, with the, the more intimate landscapes to those wider views. And I wonder sometimes, somebody like, somebody like Edward Weston, you know, he started off, he did portraiture and whatever, but he started off doing his, his art photography was quite often very small subjects. There's nautilus shells, the peppers. Um, and it was only in later life when he, when he had the, the, um, the fellowship and he's traveling around and he did wider views of, um, of, the, of the landscape, really. Uh, he, so he worked out how to organize things within a frame at a small level. Yeah. Whereas most of us start trying to organise things within a frame at a wide level, I think, as landscape photographers, because what we're interested in is the landscape. The we're, out, we're out yeah. in the landscape, that's what we want to get. Um, 
And I wonder sometimes if we miss a few tricks there by, by taking that approach. Well, I, I do think if you're working with a smaller view, you inevitably have more options to play with. You can, you can move 50 yards or even 10 yards across and have a completely different view. Hmm. Whereas if you're working in the broad view, you've got to move a mile or yeah. Or something to get a different Well, because the, the elements you, you, you're yeah. working with are bigger, yeah. So you, have to, you can spend a lot more time searching for things, finding things, seeing how things relate to each other. Yeah. More than you can with a wider view. So, yeah, I think, you could, I think smaller is better to learn with, I would say. Hmm. Yeah, you can... Um, Exercise your compositional skills. Yeah, you can, you can do many more repetitions about working out um, how compositions work, I think, at a smaller level. Yeah. Now that was ridiculously cold. That was really cold. Um, that's to ice rhyme on those. They're Scots pines. Um, I had to. I looked up to make sure that we have Scots pines elsewhere in Europe, and you do all throughout. All throughout, isn't it? Yeah. Northern Europe, you have Scots pines. Um, the further south you go, the higher altitude-wise they are. Um, probably a forty kph, fifty kph wind. Minus five, minus ten, something like that. It was absolutely bitter. Uh, and so this is another example of, you know, it's really good to be out in dreadful yeah, conditions. It's, it's <laughs> um, fantastic conditions, the way it softens everything. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole valley behind that you can't see at all. And, and this is colour. This is colour, yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course it's colour. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've only got the one black and white yes. picture, the one at the beginning. Yeah, no, it's colour, yeah. So, um, yeah. We'll, we won't use this one as an example of how to convert things to black and white. No, we won't. No, no. Actually, yes, that, we forgot to talk about that, didn't we? we? Did. We'll come back yeah. to it. Yeah. Um, so, do you have any? I mean, you've been out in very cold conditions quite often. And do you have any ways of uh, dealing with it? That, I mean, any particular top five <laughs> tips for being out in freezing weather? Uh, keep your feet, hands, and head warm. And yep. actually, the rest of it probably doesn't feel too bad. Um, cold, cold, wet feet is really dreadful, if especially you've got any distance to walk. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's just the the classic sort of things about layering. Um, I think you're right, though. I think as soon as as soon as you, your body starts to trigger that, draw your blood into your central core. Yeah. That's when everything goes wrong. It's when you start to feel really miserable, and yeah. it becomes very difficult to concentrate on making pictures. Yeah. If you if you don't do that, so you want to you want to especially obviously with a camera you want to especially keep your hands warm um, and that's fingerless gloves, <coughs> um, maybe even um, liner gloves. silk yeah. silk liners and then fingerless gloves or even surgical gloves yes. and fingerless gloves maybe mitts if it's very strong wind. Dave, um, David Clapp said that he was out in minus thirty eight and he had. Um, Bare hands. Uh, with but he said his left hand was fine. It was only, only for a few minutes, like yeah. five, ten minutes. But his right hand got frost knit, but it's where he was touching the camera. Yeah. So the camera just sucked the heat out of his yeah. fingers. Yeah. And I think just the, like they say, liner gloves or anything like that would stop or minimise that. Yeah, it's below minus 30s when you start sticking to things. Yes. I mean, like the camera, yeah. I mean, some people put um, Vaseline on their nose so that when they... <laughs> they stick the nose to it. Yes, the uh, nose doesn't stick to the back of the camera, yeah. Um, Lots of lots of good waterproof clothing is a really good thing. I mean, it's not so bad when it's actually really cold because you don't you don't really get wet. Um, although, when I was in Finland a few years ago, and you've got lots of powder snow, meter and a half, two meters of powder snow, um, we're not really used to that in this country. So you walk off what appears to be a perfectly fine path, and you disappear up over your waist in the snow, and then it gets inside, and yeah. then it's cold. As long as you keep you keep it outside, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Scotland again. Yeah. So we're back in Scotland. So um, Loch Clare, um, but not the classic view looking towards Liach. But uh, I can't remember the name of this this particular mountain. Some funny Gaelic. Which ends the classic view. Uh, out towards the way. out towards the right would be Liach. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we, I was actually with Joe and Phil Malpas and Clive Minnit and another friend, Andy Farrington. Um, we were having we were having a busman's holiday. We we actually went away um, 
to do photography together, uh, which was the first time we worked it out. I think it was um, seven years or more since we'd done All right. we'd done that. So really nice um, to do it together. And uh, we turned up at Loch Clare this morning. It had been really dreadful conditions when we'd left our digs. And we thought, well, we'll go out and see what's, what's going on. And the clouds started to part and I sort of um, hoofed it down to the edge of the loch. I got this one shot, I was just setting up the 5.4 and then it cleared entirely. And then <laughs> it just didn't work. It needed that sort of mystery that was just from the, the little bit of sun poking through there. That's wonderful, there's a strip of clear going through yeah. the thing. And if you look closely, there's snow falling all over that as well. Yeah, you can see specks in the bottom right. Yeah, and you've got kind of weird line across the front, which is ice. Yeah, on the on the loch, fantastically still. And also, what happened when the cloud cleared was the wind picked up, and then all of that wonderful stillness went. So lovely. Can we ask how are we doing for time over there? Two minutes. Ooh, yeah, fantastic. Um, I've scanned this one, I think, for you recently. You have. This yeah. is the digital version, because yes. I haven't got the scans yet. No, <laughs> they're over there. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, inside a little sort of nature reserve, just, in fact, the, the woods that you could see in the background of the previous shot, it's, it's in there. Um, and I'd noticed it from, oh, I don't know, half a mile away, just looking across at the woods, and I'd seen this wonderful serpentine shape. And then I had to work out how to get there, and uh, there was rather a dangerous access across the river. Uh, there's a, I suppose at one stage it probably had been a bridge, but now it's basically a telegraph pole laid across the river with a wire rope yeah. that you hang on to. And it, it was all covered in snow and ice on the telegraph pole. And so I somehow I made it across without falling in um, and got there and took that picture. But if you go on to the, the next one, that shows you sort of... Yeah, the action shot. Yeah, there's, there's my trusty... Linhoff. Weather um, sealed? We, well, we were t <laughs> you were joking earlier. Just, so do you just take the lens out and let the weather blow through? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, not weather sealed. It's got a Hagen dust lid, obviously, on the lens. Yes. But um, no, you know, the great thing about the, the five fours actually is that they, they cope with pretty much anything. Have them out in a blizzard, and as long as you can keep the moisture off the lens, they're fine. They, they don't seem to suffer from any issues like that. Yeah, as long as you keep the dark slides dry. Yeah, and that's the that's the secret to it, all, isn't it? Yeah, I did have um, when I came back from the recent trip to California. I when I unloaded, one of the sheets had stuck in the dark slide. I think because it had got, oh, right, wet. got wet and then dried. But when I processed it, there wasn't a mark on it. Yeah, it's just a gelatin. The gelatin reswells once it gets wet. Yeah, so, so it was it was fine. N no issue at all there. Yeah, wonderful. Nice portrait of your camera. Yeah. Ah, it's a good one for dynamic range. Yeah, we, we, did, we, we did have a question about dynamic, dynamic range. Um, I would like to know, this is Simon Gulliver, would like to know Tim and David's thoughts on dynamic range and sensors. Given the amazing images shot on transparency film over the years, how vital to making a good print is 14 stops of dynamic range? Now, we've talked about this a bit anyway. Mm. Um, and we have said you can use graduated filters, but there are situations where... Mr. Lee doesn't make a filter for this. That would be clever, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Pun punch your all own holes through the filter there for those yeah, little gaps. Yeah. Now, situations like this are very, very difficult. This is a, a rusted out um, barrel, is it? Or a it's a, it's a um, navigation buoy. Okay. Uh, so yeah. they're spherical buoys, and uh, they're sitting on a beach at um, Achnahed, uh, Achiltebui, sorry, Achiltebui, and so I'm shooting through a hole on one side into the inside of the buoy. Oh, so it's completely shaded on the inside of... Yeah, completely there. shaded. So the only light coming in that bottom corner is from the sort of perforations that are next to the hole that I'm shooting in through. Um, and it was sort of cloudy bright conditions, so the pebbles on the beach were really quite bright. Is this the Fuji? Or, this yeah. is the Fuji, yeah. So that's presumably pushing the edges. I mean, the F Fuji... I don't know who, I think Sony may make the Fuji sensors. But that's done very well. Yeah, it's looking at that. Post processing to an extent. Mm. Um, and that's one of the things, isn't it? Now, if you've got five, six stops in the camera, you've probably got another, I don't know, what would you say, two or three with post processing? I think 
um, well, let's say let's say ten stops. So you've probably got six by default, and probably about three or four in the shadows. You can push yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. So you've you've got a big big range. Yeah. But the question he's asking is how important is it? And you know, it isn't necessarily. No. No. I, well, well, like we said, Velvia people use Velvia one hundred, which has even less dynamic range than Velvia fifty. Does it? Yeah. Um, the, the shadows just block up right. very quickly, unlike Velvia, which is big, very dark shadows, but they go on and on. So yeah. you get a drum scanner out. And, and we've measured Velvia as having eight and a half stops, yeah, more I than think, people think. Yeah, I think you've got that out of some of mine, because mm. I've, I've gone to the absolute limits on, on getting an exposure and thinking, well, I'll just hold that. I'll make that a stop and a third above, and then my shadow is really a long way down. Yeah. And then you've dug detail out of the shadow, which you can... If you hold the transparency up to a bright light, you can see that detail. Yeah, if you mask out bright areas, often you can't yeah. see it, even because of your eye flares. Yeah. Especially as you get older. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I know people like Richard Childs, who um, has only mostly used a, an Epson scanner. So he's probably losing a stop and a half hmm. in the shadows, maybe more. So six stops of dynamic range, and maybe like two stop grads or three stop grads. Yeah. Most of his output is taken, and it hasn't stopped him taking pictures. No, some great pictures, some really great pictures. But, yeah. it, but it has made him work to certain constraints, like you said. Yeah. So uh, you, you work in soft light. You wait for the right moment. And quite often, I'll do that with digital now as well, because it, it quite often means better light when it's softer, less contrasty. Quite often, if you use the whole dynamic range... The full dynamic range of these things is quite handy when you've got a bright light at one end and a dark light at the other. Mm. If they're mixed up not right next to each other and then you do the, do the shadow recovery, it can often look, look quite false. So Almost HDR. Yeah, yeah, because you've got rid of any of the contrast that was inherently there. Yeah. It looks unnatural. Um, so typically you can use that dynamic range in, I mean, this is, this is possibly an exception because it's so delineated, the edges of light and dark. Yeah. That you can get away with anything. We don't know that's been in complete shadow. But yeah, we could, I mean, you can shoot with four stops of dynamic range, I'm sure, and get great shots. Yeah. Um, no, I absolutely think that's possible. Um, it is a constraint about, well, I suppose a couple of things might constrain you. Um, timing. Maybe you've only got the one opportunity to get a shot because something's happening critically. Or maybe you're only at this point for a day and you want to get the picture and you can't come back then yes, it's lovely if, you, if your camera gives you more dynamic range and it means you can deal with it. Um, but there are lots of times when I'm somewhere and I think, well, yeah, quite like that, but it's not going to work. Okay, I'll find something else. Yeah, there's, always, there's always something else. There is always something else, yeah. And yeah, Weston says something about he'd never wait 40 minutes for a photograph because if he walked somewhere else, he'd find another one in 20 minutes. So, you know, there, is all, there are always alternatives. And I think one of the problems is that we do get fixated on, on goals. I came here to make this image, that's what I'm gonna do. But I don't think that that's always the right approach. I think we ought to be much more flexible than that. We ought to be much more open to- Opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So more dynamic range, good, not essential. Yeah, it's always great, isn't it? Yeah. It's always nice to it's have. Options. It's like having a, just cause you've got a fast car, that breaks really well doesn't mean you have to use it like that all the time. No, no, you it's don't have to do 140 and break from 70 to zero in yeah. two seconds all the time. But that it would time make for it, a pretty uncomfortable ride, it would, wouldn't it? But that yeah. time when a lorry pulls out in front of you, it might be quite handy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so don't use it all the time. No, I, I, I absolutely don't think it's essential at all. No. Um, I mean, when you're when you're taking photographs out of interest on on Velvia film, um, how often are you waiting for the light to contrast to reduce? to try and work within it? Or for opportunities, the sun's going behind clouds and things like that? Yeah, fairly frequently, I suppose. I mean, I don't know, I like to go out when it's, when it's miserable. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I, You're very fortunate living in this country. Yeah, I'm very fortunate living in this country. Uh, so, a lot of the time, uh, I've engineered my opportunities to start off with, I suppose, to an extent. But if I went out and the conditions were very bright and harsh, um, then I would be looking for where I could work. So I'd be looking for working in the shade, 
Um, or I would be thinking, oh, well, there's a cloud coming along and I'll wait a couple of minutes and get it then. Yeah. Very grey and overcast day. Yes. Um, I think I recognise those trees. <laughs> yeah, near Dundonnell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I started making a sort of little series called um, Can't See the Wood for the Trees. And I just liked that. It's something I've been fascinated with for some time is this sort of thing where you get where there's, there's a, like a wall of, of trees, an enclosed space, and relates back perhaps a bit to the focus stacking question that we've had, because this is not sharp in the background. It's sharp sort of in the middle distance. It's not absolutely pin sharp in the foreground. It's shot on a 300mm um, lens, um, so you're not going to get it sharp all the way through. Yeah. Um, and I could have taken multiple exposures and focus stacked it, but I actually quite like the fact that it becomes soft. Yeah, it's a change in texture throughout the picture. Yeah. And um, these, I mean, these trees have got an amazing, almost elephant-like bark to them as well, so the textures are wonderful. Yeah, it's very, what's interesting about these particular trees, you see beech trees like this down south, and they've usually got lichen or moss or something growing on them, and they don't have these pristine grey trunks. Mm. The only, I, only, I think I've only seen them in Scotland like that, where they don't have any, any coloration on them. Yeah. So it must be about the cold weather, I think. Um, lots of moss on the ground, but it doesn't seem to, you don't seem to get the growth on the, on the trunks themselves. And I, th I felt that this had a sort of bit of mystery to it. I did work a bit in post-processing to desaturate the greens a little bit, because they were a bit too I think all strident. I have, I have Having worked with neg film and, and scanned work for quite a few photographers, film a little bit and digital a lot tends to make greens more saturated and lighter than they seem to look in reality. I, and I've seen that in, in most cameras. Yeah, I mean, I think if I think back a long, long time into the dim and distant past, when I transferred from ectochrome to Velvia, one of the things that came across with, in fact, it was before that. Um, Fuji did a, a sort of, no, it was Kodak did a quick load film with Fuji in it, I think. It's a packet film, uh, Ready Load was yes. Fuji film, I yeah. think, originally. And the thing I noticed was how strong the greens were compared to Ektachrome, because Ektachrome was very blue. It's old them, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, you're right, I think every every, Transparency film since then has made greens very strong, and it Fuji particularly yeah. has done that. Um, but the other thing that's great about Velvet is it separated all of those greens, and I think digital doesn't differentiate as differentiate much. them as much. Yeah. So they just become a sort of mass of of green. But the little the little green slider in in Lightroom, huge um, saturation down and lightness down seems to make a big difference. On, yeah. On the files I've played with. Um, what's the loch called? Well, Shulvan in the background. Yeah. Um, I forgot the name of the, the name of the loch. It's a beautiful little island there. Yeah, I mean it's stunning conditions. Shot on the, so this is shot on the XC with a fourteen mil lens, um, and we had really lovely still conditions. But there was a on the uh, on the right hand side beyond the island, there was a little bit of ripple. And I actually used negative clarity in there that just to soften, it out. to soften it out a bit because it was just a bit too, grabbed your attention a bit too much. Um, Cho, Cho likes the negative clarity. I must admit it's quite a useful tool. Yeah, it is, and I think. Uh, and I, people tend to use positive clarity too much, I think. Mm. And they, they tend to apply it overall. And I, I do use clarity, but I'm very picky about whereabouts in the picture I will use it. So. It works very well on clouds for giving them structure, on water for yep. giving it some structure. But, but I think to take attention away from an area that's a bit contrasty is quite nice. For yeah, negative clarity. Yeah, so I mean, if you use too much clarity on something like that, the tree there, it would be quite strident almost. I think crunchy, crunchy. Yeah, brittle. Yeah, that's brittle that's is the. One. Yeah. Um, so that needed a reasonable about. Lovely, uh, lovely contrast between the fallen tree, the white fallen tree, and the golden. Yeah. Upright tree. And it needed quite a little bit of rebalancing with, with the light on the water and the light in the sky. 
sort of polarizer and a, and a grad, um, and you inevitably end up with the reflection being brighter than the sky, yeah. and then you have to rebalance afterwards. In Lightroom? In Lightroom, light yeah. Room. yeah. This was really extreme conditions, and That's this amazing, has got yes. five stops of grad on it. Um, and I don't think it would have been possible otherwise. Um, but I did have to do quite a lot of Lightroom work afterwards. Um, big hailstorm coming in. Uh, about a minute less than that after I took the picture, I just had to turn around and cover the camera and, and stay there whilst it hammered down, yeah. pelting me and the other participants. We'd been, we'd been stuck in the hotel all morning because it had been miserable conditions. And then we looked out early afternoon and it looked like it was going to clear a little bit so we thought yeah let's go out and see see what we can see and I thought well where's likely to be good if it's clearing from the west it might be nice um, that view towards Stack Poly so got there and very fortunate that we got this big beefy shower coming through in really extreme um, conditions with the clouds. A wonderful glowing cloud above Stack Poly. Yeah. And they've still got hints of blue Around yeah, there's a little bit of blue on the on the extreme yeah. right and on the extreme left. Yeah, um, that you know, I did use quite a lot of clarity in the on the cloud there, especially on the bring, left there, where you can the see rain the structure in. Yeah, the the hail sto stones in. Um, but but I didn't use clarity, for instance, on the on the reeds in the in the foreground because I think that would have made them too yeah. you know, too crunchy. So is this have you used enough grads that you can't recover the shadows in the middle of your left them in, in there for contrast? Um, I can't really recover the shadows in yeah. the middle. I have recovered them a little bit. Um, the the area that was really problematic was the water on the um, on the left, yeah. where it goes between the island and the and that peninsula. It was very dark because the ground came down into that area, and then I did have to. Uh, I wanted to rebalance it so it was matched the rest of the water in the. That's, the that's where high dynamic range cameras and grads probably go together, isn't it? You can use yeah. grads and still, yeah. still recover areas like that. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem with the middle ground is that um, it, I think the heather was probably already quite dark to start off yeah. with, and then you've, you've put five stops to grad. Well, it's probably not five stops there, yeah. three and a half or whatever, you've on top got, of it. You've got three over the water because of the reflections, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, so, so it's just signal to noise ratio is just dreadful you can't do anything about it yeah. but i don't think that it looks unrealistic no, well it works with the eye it's it's it's, it's contrasting isn't it yeah um and your eye's not complaining about the fact they can see some detail in the foreground because it's a different area of the picture yeah so but it's still dark in that bottom right area oh, i like that it's a wonderful picture um should we should we look at another couple of questions being as i think we're about to change um it's one hour and we're about to change um, countries. We are about to yeah. change countries, yeah. Uh, so a couple of questions. Um, one from Craig Harris, uh, clearly a proficient and very talented photographer. I, I presume he's talking about you. Well, well it's me, maybe. Proficient I'm proficient, talented. you're talented, <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you ever suffer from creative blocks or doubts about your photography? And um, more importantly, if so, how do you break through these? Um, and where do you get the inspiration from? Presumably that's related to that as well. Uh, um, yes and yes, yeah. I'm, I'm constantly suffer doubts about my photography, actually. Uh, sometimes worse than others. Sometimes it's uh, crippling to the point that you can't make images. Um, how do you break through them? Well, I used, to, I used to find it very depressing. I used to find it pretty impossible to do anything about maybe for periods of six months at a time uh, and then I found that if I just carried on taking pictures even if I didn't particularly like the pictures that actually that was the only way to yeah to, to break through yourself about it, yeah. and I also noticed that one of the things that happens when you if you have a real crisis like that is actually it's quite often caused by uh, shifting viewpoint so it's it's actually a sign of some artistic growth your self-expectation changing yeah like that. Uh, and so what appears on the outside to be disastrous is actually heralds 
a, a positive change quite often. And related to that, do you think that um, doubts are an essential part of being a creative? Yes, I do. In fact, I'm writing an article for you at the moment, which <laughs> you'll get later this week, which talks about that. Excellent. Um, uh, I do think they are essential, and I think that anybody who is overwhelmingly um, positive about their work probably isn't doing very good work. <laughs> you know, it's one thing saying. Uh, I would agree. Yeah. Uh, it's one thing saying that you believe that about your work, but actually, in your inner soul, if you if you actually are hugely confident, I don't think that's right. I think I think we all need. I think self doubt is just part of the coin of being self critical. It's the fuel that moves you onward. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think it's. Um, Robin Sinton asks, um, as you are moving over to digital sourcing. And moving away. Partially. Partially. <laughs> as you are using digital as well as film. Yeah. Um, what difference do you think the Canon DSR will make to your decisions? Okay, this is... Um, if, if you were going to... I suppose he's saying uh, compare something like that 50 megapixel camera with your large format. Do you think it would make it more attractive to you? Well, I think that's a question about resolution in a way isn't it mm. and for me that's not the issue for me the difference between the two cameras is not about resolution effectively speaking for a while now in terms of the biggest print that you want to be able to make the 5.4 or, or a high-end you know like Nikon D800 or whatever yeah they're going to give you a good enough print that's not the issue yeah. the issue is about how the camera works how you interact with it and also um, how it changes your viewpoint which are two, two sides of the same coin yeah. so I think for me using a, a view camera uh, is very has been hugely important to how I see the landscape. This is this is the camera as a modifier to your process. It's the process of taking pictures and using a camera, not necessarily what the camera can do. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not. It's not its technical abilities, although to some extent it is. Yeah. Uh, but it's no. It's more the fact that when I use a view camera, there's a ritual involved. There's a slowing down, and I find that I don't generally get the same depth of work when I'm working with digital as I do with the view camera and that's nothing to do with the technical capabilities of the camera. Mm. Absolutely just nothing. Just, just the processes you go through making a picture. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, it's a fantastic camera. It's a brilliant piece of kit. Would I swap to it from the view camera wholeheartedly tomorrow? No. I will say something actually because it's we're talking about. Um, I've said we'd cover some things about the 5DS and the 5DSR, and one of the most interesting discoveries I've made, and it was hinted at by his ICE article sometimes some time back, is the fact that uh, when I tested this against the 5D3, I shot this camera at a range of apertures, and I shot the 5D3 at a range of apertures. F22 on the 5DS or 5DSR was as sharp or sharper than F11 on the 5D3. Um, now F22, everybody says you shouldn't use it, especially on a camera as many, as many megapixels as this. People are saying you should only shoot at F5.6. Really? Uh, yeah, because that's where you get the maximum resolution. Um, I, I wholeheartedly disagree. Uh, having tested this, most of the lenses or many lenses get best best results when you get down to about f11 for a start. Well, but typically the lens's best results will be in the middle of the aperture range, won't they? Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, very often it's the centre results are better around f4 or f5.6. But corners, um, smaller apertures fix lens, smaller apertures fix lens problems. Right. Um, so if you've got spheric aberrations or you've got some smearing, you stop down and they go away. Right. Um, but everybody thinks of diffraction as a as a, a limit. You know, you hit 
F22 and that's it, you can't get anything. There's no more detail after that. In actual fact, diffraction is a reduction in contrast rather than a limit. So there's still detail higher up, um, but it's low contrast. So is the, the, the softening effect that we're all told happens, um, I mean, there is a physics reason for that, yes. but effectively is that softening about a lowering in contrast, not about, not a, about absolute ultimate sharpness? It's a lowering in contrast. At some point it will go to zero. Right. But more megapixels, more, more data allows you to extract contrast back out again. Right. So just in the way that we have, you know, when you're listening to audio files, 44 kilohertz is a standard for audio. Right. We can't hear 44 kilohertz. The reason it's there is to provide more data to, to make things sound better. And you get 96 kilohertz audio files. And this, is, this in many ways, you can consider as a, as a 96 kilohertz camera. You don't need to use the whole 50 megapixels. You can make your enlargements the same as a 5D3. Yeah. But the extra resolution allows you to get better data out. Well, that's, I mean, if, if I go back to comparisons with film and, uh, and digital, we were talking about, you know, ultimate print size. No, it doesn't make any difference. But if I have a 5.4 original properly scanned by you and I make a 2016 print, it won't look any sharper than something off that, but it will have more colour information. It will have more colour information, yeah. Um, It'll um, have more nuanced colour. Yeah, it's a fine detail. It's, it's, it's the very fine detail that makes a difference. And it's something that... that always struck me because you would hear film photographers uh, move to digital and, said, and say things like, I've never noticed diffraction before. It was never a problem before. And I think that's because film had resolution all the way up to a certain limit. The scanner mm. may not get it all out. Right. Uh, and so it was doing the similar things to what the... Because we were always system. told that um, the diffraction problem was also about the, the construction of the sensor mm. and... and those physical limits related as well. You're, you're saying that as much as anything else, it's not about the shape of the pits or anything like not that. Not necessarily, no. It's no. just the, the frequency of the, the, the detail there. Right. And I mean, I, I, I'm going to put, put some samples on the website at the moment. So you can, you can see a picture I took at near Scarborough at F22. Right. And, and front to back sharpness. It's great, F22. Right, uh, and yet it's still sharper than the the, the sharpest 5D3 file, F11. So, if you want well, to consider, well, so that's that's overall very good news, yeah. isn't it? Then <laughs> you don't need to think of it as a, a camera for printing bigger. You can, if you like, just think of it as a camera for getting more depth of field. Yeah, well, I th I th you know, I think there's a huge uh, positive to be said. You know, people always think about it: how, how big can I make a print, and it still looks okay. If you make a, you know, a reasonable size print, I don't know, 12, 16, maybe even smaller, but it's perfect, mm. you know, it has a jewel-like quality. In some ways, that's much more impressive than a, yes. never mind the quality, feel the width approach, isn't it? Yeah, I it think. certainly is. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I mean, some people shoot 10.8 instead of 5.4. It's because you can go to whole wall sizes with 10.8. Yeah. It looks exquisite when it's about 30, 30 by 40 inches. West, Western almost only ever did contact prints. Yes, yeah. You know, so it's <laughs> no enlargement at all because it, the tonality that you got in that was incredible, so it, smooth. And there, there are photographers like Pete Hyde who shoots F22 all the time. Yeah. Um, and the results are brilliant, yeah. Maybe slightly softer and maybe if he did a very large print it would look slightly softer than one taken by somebody else. But that F22 gives a consistency of tone across the picture. Yeah. That's really, really nice. Um, we'll try and fit a, another question in. Have we got any more questions about the 5DS while we're here? Um, what adapters are available for using Canon glass on the Sony A7R? We'll come to that and another question. We hopefully are going to get a Sony A7R 2 um, as, as it comes out, if not slightly before. So at that point in time, we'll do a big comparison. Um, and the great thing in short is Canon lenses are fantastic um, on, on any camera. Um, the reason to change from a 5D Mark III to a Canon 5DS. More depth of field. Um, it has a fantastic shutter on it. Um, it's, it's a lot quieter. 
Is it? Yeah, they've put some damp cams in there to dampen the action of it. Um, but I would say resolution is great. This, this idea that you can print the same size as you were with the 5D3, but they will have a richness to them hmm. because you can um, print with more detail. You can sharpen yeah. more effectively. You get more colour. So it's all, it's all progressing in all... In, in it needs not only the progression in the camera, but, you know, the progression we've had in printers in the last five years. Yeah. Five years ago, if you'd had a camera like that, you wouldn't have been able to output it in any way that... No. ..that gave it in any justice, would uh, you? And I have seen when we were doing the big camera comparison, I printed out all of the pictures... Yeah. ..at different sizes. And I did try at one point printing out at 720 DPI... Yeah. ..instead of 360. And I can see a difference. Right. If you get fine, detailed lines, you can actually see more crisper detail at 720. Yeah, because lots of people say that you can't tell the difference, no. don't they? Yeah. Um, I can see that without a loop, just, just by looking side by right. side. Um, so I could have done once upon a time, but now, no, not with... <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, once you print at 720, it's a different ball game because you, your 15-inch your print that you could print at 24 megapixels is now an 8x10. Yeah. So um, all of a sudden you need more megapixels to do these prints. So you can think about it as having that finer detail, allowing you to produce something a little bit more exquisite at smaller sizes. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a really good way to go. I, 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 don't, I won't say that I won't ever make big prints again, but I am increasingly making, when I do make prints, making them yeah, in that smaller range. Yeah. Um, I think it's, they have a beauty about them. Iceland? Yes, this uh, the ever popular Jokul Salon. Uh, although I tried to do something a little bit different with it uh, when we went this year, there were more bergs than I've ever seen. It, it was it, constipated, I believe. They were all stuck round the <laughs> outflow. Yeah, um, I don't know why that is. Um, what the reasons for that are? I'm sure it's varied. I think over it's, the years anyway. it's quite shallow as it comes out. It, it is very shallow just as it goes out into the river. Um, further back it's really quite deep where the, the glaciers gouged the, the material. Um, so we had lots of big blue bergs and they were all jostling with each other and I'd walked past this area about an hour before and then I came back and I noticed that these ones are all lining up and I like that sort of... Um, interlocking like hills. These were moving? They were all moving, yeah, yeah. so uh, I got one or two frames like this and then they drifted apart and then it didn't work anymore. Um, shot on a 200mm lens um, on the XC. Um, so I wouldn't have been able to do that on a 5.4 anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a 600 or would it be an 800? But um, the, the colours of the blue in there are, are remarkable. Yeah. Um, does, it, does it come out as... as, as ever come out as blue as it looked when you were there? Because that's an, it's, it's an extraordinary blue in real life. I don't think that's far off. I don't know. It's very difficult to tell if I, you know, without having the mm. laptop actually there yeah. next to it. Um, it seems to do quite a good, I mean, it's, it's aqua, isn't it, yeah. really? And it does, the, that camera seems to do it pretty well straight without having to do much in the way of fiddling. Um, I know that, um, Daniel Bergman, when he does stuff in the ice, he does several sort of test things so that he can then fine-tune the colour afterwards okay. um, to make it how, how, you know, more accurate to how it was. But we're into that sort of grey area with, with human colour perception where, you know, there's such a wide sort of acceptability on colour. Yeah. This is sort of... Um, Trying to make a, a visual puzzle out of a wider landscape. Uh, so lots of people look at this and they think it's a reflection, and then they think, no, it can't be a reflection. Hold on a second, there's something a bit weird going on there, isn't there? Because the because the reflection is not the same shape as the mountains; it's the negative of the mountains, um, and it's uh, it's bergs. Presumably, if I hadn't have seen that previous shot. Oh uh, well. Ah, okay, yes. So that's the, the wider view, yeah. That's a long lens to sample out. Yeah, it's a, it's a long lens and it's, um, it's lying down on top of a beached berg on the, on the, <laughs> on the shore of uh, Brythe Salon and uh, um, 
getting very, very cold. Hopefully beached. Oh, it definitely was beached. Right. Yeah, it's completely beached. Yeah. Now I'm, uh, I'm. Uh, I'll get on to health and safety and icebergs in a minute. Um, yeah. So I just, you know, I just wanted to make more of a puzzle out of it. And uh, so also, there's a sort of suggestion of birds' wings and yeah. uh, that sort of kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it's lovely. Great day. We had great conditions there. It was really pretty cold. Um, that's also along the shore there at Brava Salon. Um, I suppose the ice was probably two, three centimetres thick uh, with these bubbles stuck in it. Using the Canon, this is the 5D3 yeah. with a tilt shift lens. This is, in fact, it's a 90 mil tilt shift lens, so one of the older tilt shift lenses, but still fantastic quality yeah. you get on with the dslr tilts um yeah they're they're slower to use than than doing it with a view camera it definitely takes longer it's counterintuitive in a way that is do you think that's your experience or they are just the, because it's finer and yeah you know, you've got much l uh, finer tolerances mm. in order to get your your plane of focus right but also just the the mechanism for changing, because you, you choose target points. Going backwards and forwards. It just going takes, back and forwards, a loop. Yeah, a loop yes. takes no time at all to go backwards and forwards. Yeah. Going backwards and forwards with your little joystick. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's quicker now, because if you press it once, it goes to the middle. Yeah. This, and the, and this is actually you, something I've chatted with Rob, Rob from Canon about. about yeah, I've split had a split screen view. Yeah, uh, I've asked him about that as well, yeah. Um, because Nikon have a split screen view, but they only do it side by side because they build it as making sure that your horizon is level. Right, uh, okay. Or that both sides are in focus. I, don't know, but it, I think it's built for the horizon. So you, right. can't, you can't swap it around the other way around. Because it'd be fantastic to be able to move the two parts around. Yeah. Um, you ought to be able to designate a target. Yeah. Because the other points. thing is if you've got a tilted plane, you, want, you might not want a target immediately above the other one. You might want it... Side to side. For side a, to side for, slightly. Yeah, for compound yeah. tilts. Yeah. Um, One day. So the the classic bergs on the on the beach, um, and yeah, it is it is fantastic. But I saw some ridiculous behaviour there. It's a bit year. of risky risky behaviour on that beach, isn't there? Yeah, and I think it's not won't be long till somebody kills themselves. To be honest, and people, the, people the really the scary thing I think is that um, they might take somebody else with them. Yes. This was. Big waves, three metre waves, three and a half metre waves. And they were coming, as they came in up the beach, they were probably travelling maybe up to 40 or 50 metres up the beach. And people were walking into the, the zone between the, the shore and where the waves were ending up and working in that zone because it was only every once in a while that you got a really big wave. But they're working in that zone and they're looking along the beach and they're not watching what the sea's doing. And I saw three people get knocked over by the sea. Luckily, none of them were hit by a berg. Well, yeah, so when the birds get dragged back down again. <laughs> well, you know, a, a metre cube berg weighs a tonne. And if that hits you in the back of the legs, when it gets easily picked up by the water, you're not getting up again. No. And, OK, if you want to risk your life for that, that's fine. But if there's somebody else on the beach and they see that happen to you, they're probably going to go and try and save you. Yeah. And I just think that that is irresponsible behaviour. And what will happen, you know, the Icelanders are fantastically tolerant of idiotic behaviour. They think, being Norse, being good Norse people, they think that, um, you know, you should, you should get on with it and if you end up killing yourself, fine. But if it does happen and it's, say, I don't know, a German tourist or, God forbid, an American tourist who dies doing that, there will be pressure put on them and we will all be restricted on that beach. Yeah. I've seen it at Vic as well, where the waves come out. They're trapped at Vic. Oh, well, the storm beach at Vic, um, was it four people who drowned there the other year? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, we went there later this, I don't know, two days after this, I think, and we saw two people knocked over. Um, it's scary, the power of the sea along that southern 
shore of Iceland is incredible. And you do get freak waves. Yeah. Very. Another country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, California. Yeah. Um, yeah, talking of health and safety, that's not one of my groups standing on the end there. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long way down. It's, um, well, the, that's El Capitan in the background, and we're higher than El Cap. Um, right. So it's three and a half thousand feet or something down. And this afternoon that we were there taking this picture, um, one of that wing flyer guy killed himself. Um, he jumped off about an hour or two after we were there, and he and a friend were going to try and fly through a narrow gap. I heard about this, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's and they didn't make it. It's banned in Yosemite. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's an amazing place, Taft Point. It's an absolutely incredible place. Um, and I love the fact that there aren't barriers all over it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, because, you know, that's how it should be left. It, you know, it def definitely should be left like that. But Whilst we're in black and white, we have a question from David Hawkes, who was, who was asked, uh, does, do you have any advice on the best way to convert raw files to monochrome, especially for when the intention is to mi mimic platinum, palladium or toned images? Right, I have always pretty much gone for straight black and white. Um, so maybe you can talk about the platinum, palladium toned bit. Um, but I, I just do them in Lightroom using the the black and white module and then I would probably go in and play about with the colour sliders if I want to introduce contrast in particular areas. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the time it's best guess yeah. for black and white is actually very good indeed. Um, but if you do say have, you know, you've got a lot of greens and blues and you want to put some contrast in playing about with the sliders, you can actually, you can do that very effectively. Um, I've noticed it can be quite dangerous to, to have two adjacent sliders in opposite directions for lightness. You can end up with very odd contrast changes or tonality changes throughout the yeah. picture. Yeah, you have to, all of these things you have to be careful. But it's also really good to experiment. You know, people take the sliders a long way yeah. and then bring them back and see what happens. Um, as far as the platinum and palladium stuff goes, um, I mean, I like Silver Effects. It does a very good job. It does a nice job in, in the way it simulates grain better than most. I've seen. Right. But the, a lot of the tonality in platinum and palladium and alternative processes, what you won't see in those pictures is pure whites and pure blacks very often. So the first thing you should do is try and lift your black level so, you're not, so you don't have pure blacks and knock your white level down. Um, and then try and have a lot of tonality in the shadows. So, you know, the, the, the shadow extension in a palladium print is huge. It's, you can look really deep into the shadows and it keeps going on and on. Mm. Uh, so you, you should probably put a curve on um, to compress your shadows down. So instead of using shadow recovery, you want to use maybe shadow the other way to try and compress the shadows. Right. Um, but most of it's to do with the tonality of the whites and blacks. I think, I mean, that's a, a good starting point anyway. So. But I'm like you, I think when I've used black and white, a lot of, a lot of the results are seen black and white are more to do with the way it's dodged and burned than necessarily the, 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 the conversion. Yeah, yeah and, on, uh, and on an image like this, I would use basically the same sort of principles that I would have done in the, in the wet dark room a long time ago. Yeah. And I, and I would go in and I would use, yes, effectively dodging and burning with a brush in this case. To, to hold back highlights and to open areas of shadows up. Yeah, and you've got lovely soft tones on the right hand side, nothing going down to like zone three or anything. Can yeah. So it's, it's just zone, zone relationships, tonal relationships. Yeah, well, you, it's picture. the classic thing for giving you depth, isn't it? You've got reasonable contrast on the, on the left because it's close to you. The right is all very distant, so you, and it's a sort of slightly hazy day. You want to have it soft there, don't you? So a atypical view of <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, L L cap um, with a with a cloud cap on it um, from Valley View, which is the which is the classic place to do it. Normally shot at sunset. This was sort of um, late afternoon, I suppose, not that long off what would have been sunset, except we didn't get one because it 
was just cloudy. Um, but I thought very, very nice and moody, and I thought worked worked very well. There's, I love the fact that the, um, the so the river goes behind those trees in the middle ground, and there's mist rising off it, which is why you've got this sort of okay. slight softening of the base of the cloud. Um, and I love when you when you have a mountain and it disappears into cloud, you almost imagine it goes on further. Yeah, suggestion. Suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Dogwood in mist in the Yosemite high country. Um, Popular subject for Yosemite photographers, but not done. Not like usually in mist, I don't think. No, no I mean, pe people do love the dogwoods, and they are. They're incredible tr trees, really amazing trees. Um, but we'd looked at them two or three times during the week, and we just couldn't make them work because the, the forest is so complex. And the great thing about the mist coming in is it simplifies that, and then... Yeah. You can make it... Because the normal solution for the dogwoods is to put the river behind them and then long exposure it, you get a blurred background and you've done it with the same sort of thing but with mist. Yeah, well, and, you, and you su obviously, of course, you suggest the trees by, by, by doing that. Um, and the luminosity of the flowers is, is enhanced, I think, by doing that. I wasn't sure how well that was going to work on film, but actually it worked very well on film as well. Because um, it's very difficult, even with a one-degree spot, to pick one of those flowers and actually yeah. work out. <laughs> you have to go right up to it. And yeah, which is difficult when it's when there's a fifty foot drop yeah. between you and the tree. <laughs> Mr. Cornish's California office, I like to call this. Uh, the best, the best picture of Joe I've seen. I say. <laughs> <laughs> no no offence, Joe. <laughs> uh, I just, I was just really. It's a setup. Joe was off photographing somewhere else, and and I was trying to take this uh, with this huge redwood in the background and I um, yeah there's Mr Cornish um, and I noticed that there was this platform and I thought oh well if Joe stood on there that you know that would that would work really well um, so this is shot on the Sony um, a7 II uh, with the Zeiss lenses uh, I can't remember which one now 24 maybe um, What's really weird, I thought, was just the, the overall scale. The foreground, which you might think is a hillside, is, is a fallen sequoia. And the log is something like 250 feet long. That log that you see sitting on the top. This one. That one there. Yeah. Zoom in on it. So that's a two foot diameter log. Okay. So it's just, you know, it's like um, Land of the Giants. Yes. It just completely messes with your head once you start to sort of think about it. Um, this was a really good test of the dynamic range on the Sony um, because the, the sky in this area here was really, well you can see it's here. pretty going isn't it? Almost yeah. Going. But with a polarizer and a little bit of work in, in Lightroom afterwards really sort of pulled it back so I think it it, it looks pretty, I think it looks pretty it natural. Yeah. yeah. New Zealand. Yeah, so we do have, we do have a question about New Zealand. Um, well, two, a question about scouting, um, which is how do you go about scouting, if you've not been to a location before, and this is from Nick Brown, um, how do you approach it? How do you scan the location, how do you work out where to go and what to do? <laughs> okay, um, I do not trawl the net for hundreds of photographs of a place. Um, I might read text about somewhere. Yeah. Uh, this is a beach, red beach wood in uh, just outside Fieldland National Park. So looking for areas that might interest you topically rather than visually. Yeah. And then I just go and look and I try and be as open to the possibilities of what I find as I possibly can be. And I find that if I've looked at too much stuff beforehand, however, in a minute we will see some classic viewpoints. But they're not, you know, I think they work as pictures, but they're not the pictures that I love from when I go to these places. The pictures that I love from when I go to these places are the ones that I think are more my interpretation of the place. And if I've seen a picture of something before, 
it's very difficult to kind of break out of that and make yeah. it mine. Um, so I don't do a huge amount of in-depth research. I'll, I'll read information about the country. I might read information about um, the ecosystems. I might read information about the geology. And I'll think, oh, that sounds like, a, oh, that sounds like an interesting place to go and have a look yeah. at. But I generally try and avoid looking at photographs. So you're interested, you're, you want something to get you engaged with the location, and that's something about the location itself, quite often. Yeah, yeah. And not have in my head somebody else's interpretation of that place. Um, so having said that, here's a, here's a classic Meraki boulders. boulders. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, it's, it's sunrise, um, you know, normally shot sunrise. Um, unfortunately, when I was there, sunrise coincided with high tide and there was no dry beach. <laughs> so I end, it was coming up to my knees at various points. Yeah, it so works very well to isolate. <laughs> there. Well, Mel uh, Melvin Nicholson actually asked here, he said, uh, did you undertake before arriving any research or did you seek out new compositions or on iconic viewpoints? Do you even shoot iconic viewpoints? Well, there's an iconic, there's an iconic place. Um, yes, I did shoot iconic places. Partly, I think I had to because I'm contemplating doing a tour. Yeah. So I need, I need to have those pictures. Um, it's a sad fact of human nature that if I presented 20, even if they were stunning photographs of New Zealand that were not places that anybody had heard of, they would go, yeah, but you haven't got the iconic places. We're not going to go on your tour. So yeah. um, so you kind of have to do that. So you, um, you run a bait and switch, show them all the iconic viewpoints, and then take them to the <laughs> interesting ones. Uh, what's the, somebody called it once, so they said, um, sell people what they want and give them what they need. Like it. Um, so yeah, you have, you have to have some of these things. So yes, I'm Meraki boulders. I was fascinated anyway, because I think the geology is really interesting, how the hell these things are formed by accretion inside a hillside yeah. is really interesting. Am I, am I thinking that I've read somewhere that, that a lot of these got stolen and then the uh, New Zealand um, government said, that we're gonna have an amnesty if you bring them back, please. I don't know about the amnesty, but yeah, they, they did get stolen over the years. They in ended up in yeah, yeah. farmyards and places, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, for a long time they weren't, they were just, oh, there's those weird boulders. Yeah, we'll have one of those. We'll have two of those either side of the drive. Well, they do, I mean, <laughs> they are self-regenerating because they just appear out of the, out of the cliff yeah, face. Yeah, the, the, the back of this cliff face is, well, it's not a cliff, it's a very soft um, shale, shale mud, silt, mudstone. Yeah. Um, like Saltwick, sort of. Yeah, well, yeah. softer than that. Right. Um, and it's slick as hell when you walk on it when it's wet. It's like it's been greased. Right. Um, and they just they pop out every once in a while as it as it erodes they just appear. Um, so the the ones further out are more eroded and the, this one's quite close. Yeah. So it's quite in in you know I said it was unfortunate that it was high tide but actually it's quite good because it meant that the rounder ones are at the back of the um, at the at the back of the beach so it worked better. Another iconic viewpoint, Mitre Peak. A wonderful glow. Yeah, you know. I never thought I would get an early morning shot at, of Mitre Peak because it was um, seven metres of rainfall on average you get in. <laughs> Is that Fjordland? Fjordland, yeah. yeah. Seven metres of rainfall a year. Um, you can see why it's called Milford Sound. I mean, you know, it's just like South Wales. <laughs> Only when I go on holiday there. Yeah. Um, so I was very lucky. I was very lucky to get that. And it was a, it was a great moment. But it's technically not that great because this was shot a couple of years ago, not on my last trip, and it's um, shot on the GF, so it's not wonderfully sharp, but it still has, it's I think, a lot of emotion in it. Um, I should probably ask our assistant, do we have any other questions about the Canon 5DS that people sent in? No? Any other questions on top of that? Looks like we've covered most of them so far. So. Okay. I think we're almost there anyway. This was, this was shot on the last one. I think this might be the last picture. Um, so this is uh, Farewell Spit at the north end of South Island. Um, and it's about 30 or 40 K 
Uh, it's longshore drift, basically. So okay. all of this is yeah. material that's come from the Southern Alps. All right. And, wow. and taken up and then is creating this great long spit, which is growing by tens of metres a year, I think. Um, there's a lighthouse towards the north end, which used to be right at the end and now is over a kilometre from the end. So that's how much it's grown since yeah. we've, we've yeah. been there. Um, and it's just an incredibly wild place. I thought it was a fabulous place. It's, uh, you're only allowed on if you go on an organised tour. Um, I was very lucky when I went, there were only four people on the tour that day, so... Yeah. Had the place to ourselves. Not too many footprints. With a, a great guy who's uh, our guide. Um, so, uh, really interesting place. Yeah, no, if it's big enough, it doesn't matter about footprints. And there's 40 or 50 kph wind going all the time when we were there. So, <laughs> yeah, any footprint long. filled in in about, yeah. in about a minute and a half. Yeah. Uh, well, I, th I think Iceland is just a... F uh, not, sorry, not Iceland. We're on New Zealand is just a fantastic country. Just really... Really interesting place. Too um, far away then. Took you 24 hours of flying, was it? Yeah. That's yeah. a long time in the air. It is. And it, it actually, on the way back, wasn't too bad. But on the way there, probably took two or three days to to get over it. Yeah. 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 Um, so well, that's, that's it. Thanks for showing us those pictures. We do have... Uh, we, need to, we need to mention one more thing, don't we? Do. we I think, yeah. We do. Um, so... Both Tim and I are taking part in um, the Moore's View Photographic Seminar, which is uh, on uh, is it 31st of October uh, in Pickering in, uh, in wonderful North Yorkshire. And if you'd like to come along, we'd love to see you there. A number of um, great photographers involved in that. We're going to give talks and we're going to... The general theme is about, is about the weather. It's in support of the um, Mountain Rescue uh, for... The North York Moors, uh, and I think it's a great, great cause. But also, I think it'd be really interesting to take part in and, we'll, to, and to see you there. And we'll put some news on the website about that, um, so you'll be able to see and follow the links to book if you want to go. Um, finally, just about this this camera, we have put a, a new story up about the Canon 5DS. Uh, if you do have any questions, please. Feel free to add comments to it or send send us emails. We can add things to the article anytime. Um, one of the things quite a few people were, were saying to us was how are the lenses good enough for this camera? Um, and, and just as a little parting point, I, I got these two old lenses off my father, off his Canon A1. From, this one's from the Berlin 1980 Winter Games. And Whilst I was testing these lenses, I thought I'd test this alongside all of them. Um, it turns out this is perfectly good enough for a 50 megapixel camera, so you don't need the very best lens in the world to make the most of this camera. Um, it's, it's a great camera. Please ask us some questions about it. Um, and thank you very much for taking part. Um, hope to join you in the next webinar. Goodbye and goodbye for you. Time to return to Rioja, I think. Yeah. Very much so. Good night. Cheers.